So can I confirm that the live stream has started? Yes, it's started, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to go to each councillor in turn to confirm that they can hear and be heard. It's a legal requirement for me to do so. And I will begin with the committee members. Councillor Bartlett. Good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. And I can see and hear you. Councillor Sebastian Bowen. Uh, Madam Chairman, I can see and hear you. Thank you. I can see you. you. <laughs> Councillor Helen Ironson. Yes, Madam Chairman, I can see and I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. I can see and hear you. Councillor Tim Price. Hello, Madam Chairman. I can see you. I can hear you. Splendid. And I can see and hear you. Uh, Councillor David Summers, who's substituting for Councillor Alan Selden. Yes, I can hear you and see you. Good afternoon, David. I can hear and see you. Councillor Kevin Tillett. Good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I can hear and see you clearly. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillor Tillett, and I can hear and see you. Um, and we also have members of the Executive present, Councillor Liz Harvey, Cabinet Member, Finance and Corporate Services. Yes, Chair, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillor Harvey. Thank you for being in attendance today. Uh, Councillor Ange Tyler, Cabinet Member, Housing, Regulatory Services and Community Safety. Yes, Chair, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Councillor Tyler. Thank you for your attendance today. Uh, is Councillor Hitchener in attendance today? No, I think he might. He may be along later, perhaps. Um, I believe we have an apology from Councillor Watson. Are there any other cabinet members present? Thank you. Do we have uh, a, the Chair of Health Watch Herefordshire instead present? Uh, not, not at present, uh, a Chair. No. Thank you. Uh, in view of the numbers in attendance, uh, can I ask the officers to introduce themselves when they're invited to speak during the meeting? Thank you. So I'm going to open the meeting. So welcome to this meeting of the Adults and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee on this Tuesday, the 26th of January 2021. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Heritage Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Heritage Council YouTube channel and is making an official recording. To ensure that the recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Microphones should be muted when you are not speaking. If any committee member loses connection and it is not possible to recover the connection within a reasonable amount of time, the meeting will continue as long as there is a quorum of committee members. When you wish to speak, please use the blue hand button, which depending on the Zoom version you're using is to be found either against your name in the participants list or via the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen. I will then invite you to speak in order of your hand being raised. Voting will be undertaken electronically using the voting software within the virtual meeting platform. Only committee members may vote. At the appropriate time, non-voting attendees will be moved to a breakout room until all eligible votes have been cast. In the event that electronic voting is not possible to use or there is a technical failure, I will ask each committee member by means of a roll call to indicate if they are for, against or are abstaining. The results of the roll call will only be recorded in the minutes where there is a requirement to do so. Agenda item number one, apologies for absence. Have any apologies been notified to the clerk? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, I'm Ben Ball, uh, Democratic Services Officer and Clerk to the meeting. Um, the apologies, as you mentioned, have been received from uh, Councillor Selden, uh, one of our committee members. Uh, we've also had apologies from Councillors Crockett, her uh, Cabinet Member, Health and Adult Wellbeing, and Councillor uh, Watson, Cabinet Support Member for Adults and Communities. Uh, and finally, we've had uh, apologies from Stephen Vickers, Director of Adults and Communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Agenda item number two, named substitutes. Have any named substitutes been notified? Uh, as you mentioned again, Chair, um, uh, Councillor Summers is uh, kindly uh, present uh, for, for Councillor Seldon. Thank, thank you, Mr. Boyd, and welcome, Councillor Summers. Agenda uh, item number three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare any Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or other interests in any agenda item? Agenda item number four, questions from members of the public. On this occasion, no questions have been received from members of the public. Agenda item number five, questions from councillors. No questions have been received from councillors. Agenda item number six, the budget saving proposal amendment uh, 2122. 
Committee members will be aware that at the last meeting on the 13th of January uh, 2021, a budget saving proposal was put on hold as a consequence of a recent High Court judgment. This additional meeting has been convened to consider an amended saving proposal and to determine any recommendation that the committee wishes to make to Cabinet. In addition to the report and appendix in the agenda, presentation slides have been circulated in a supplement. Can I invite Andrew Lovegrove, the Chief Finance Officer, and officers from Adults and Communities Directorate to introduce the report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm, could I hand over to Paul Smith? I, I think this is very much a, an operational matter for, um, for the committee to consider. So, Paul, could you take us through the, uh, the proposals? Thank you. Uh, I will defer to Mr. Davies if that's okay, oh, Andrew. Um, it's it's uh, an operational submission and it's not something I'm as familiar with as Mr. Davies, if, if that's okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Paul. Um, Lee Davis, Head of Prevention and Support Services in the Adult and Community Directorate. Uh, I trust everybody can hear me. Um, yes, the amended proposal um, uh, includes the, um, uh, well, it, it preserves the um, uh, the element of the proposal that you had previously um, of uh, identifying a £200,000 um, savings by applying a 3.9% increase to the pension income received in 2021 uh, to the um, charges for uh, the delivery of, of adult social care services. Uh, and supplements that, uh, it's important to say that that 200, that's that, um, that, that application in April uh, uh, of 2020, um, as we discussed last time, um, was, um, was put on hold um, due to uncertainty about various uh, benefits during the course of the, the COVID outbreak. So uh, this all remains within um, policy and remains within previous decisions. Uh, uh, additional to that, there, uh, there is identified a uh, £312,000 saving uh, by applying a 2.5% uh, increase to the state retirement income uh, in, uh, due in April uh, 2021. Um, and um, the, um, on top of that, to bring up the um, saving to the full uh, £520,000 required, um, there is a um, anticipated £8,000 saving through conducting reviews of uh, those who are nil charge payers once we undertake when, when we undertake assessments uh, of, of their contribution uh, and um, also a review of uh, disability related expenses uh, people in receipt of disability related expenses to, uh, to identify changes in circumstances. Um, we wish to make it clear that all of the data that will be that are presented in the uh, to you um, both uh, uh, in writing and indeed verbally during the course of this uh, meeting, uh, are based on the um, assumption that the minimum income guarantee uh, and the personal expenses allowance, which are set by the Department of Health and Social Care, will remain frozen uh, for 21-22, as I believe it has for the last few years. So the minimum income guarantee is the government's uh, clear statement about um, what money should be left to each individual um, once any charge, the absolute minimum that should be left to someone um, at the end of any uh, uh, analysis of their charging and the personal expenditure allowance is a similar uh, calculation for those people who are in long-term residential care. Uh, Madam Chair, if you wish, I can go through um, further the uh, uh, implications of, of that um, uh, calculations uh, that are in the, um, in the information you have, but I don't know whether you want to pause at this point or, or ask me to continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. So I would say continue right now. I don't have any, uh, there are no questions uh, being, uh, no, no hands up at the moment. Um, uh, uh, will you be going through the slides that we had as a supplementary? Uh, that, that would be my intention, uh, Councillor. Yeah. Yes. I think, I, think I, I would say that let's go through that because I think they, they may answer a number of, uh, of queries. Uh, I have a hand up now from Councillor Bowen. So we'll just pause a moment. I'll take this question from Councillor Bowen. Councillor Bowen? No, Councillor Bowen, do you have a question? You're on mute, Councillor Bowen. No, okay, well, I'll... I'll oh. there, there we are, yes, yes. <laughs> Councillor Bowen, do you have a question? I do, yes, yes, sorry, sorry oh, about oh. that. Um, okay. When you're saying 
is, is you're saying you're, you're, I presume you're implying that you are taking an extra 2.5% from the uplift given to the people in, in, the, in receipt of or, or getting services from us. It's not. Well, it's, what we, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, Ken. The, so what, the way what, you put it, it seems you're just, uh, you're giving them an uplift, but it's not the other way around, isn't it? You're taking money from them. Uh, what we're, pretty clear. Sorry, Councillor, yes. What, what we are it's, doing is we are taking into account when we set the charges, the 2.5% increase that they will receive in their state pensions uh, from April 2021. So when we calculate charges, we take into account income from pensions and indeed income relating to certain benefits. Um, and um, we put on hold the, uh, take, the, the process of taking into account the income that was received in April 2020 of 3.9%. Uh, proposal, uh, the original proposal included that. This proposal also includes that we take into account the uplift in, uh, in state re retirement pension of 2.5% uh, that, that will be with us in April 2021. So, um, yes, it, when we calculate the charge, what, it, it, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult, it's a very, very difficult piece of mathematics and, uh, um, uh, for, and, and very much a, an individual uh, exercise where we look at people's individual incomes and the, uh, mm -hmm. what benefits and pensions they are on. Um, and the, the, I will come on to that in the course of the, of the, the, the presentation. Um, but, the, but the important point is, is what, uh, what pensions and what benefits we take into account uh, and the, so the proposal is to say we will count all that income as income when we take into account what charge they should they should um, uh, ultimately ultimately be set. So thank it, you. Yes, I, yeah, I, I, I thought it was that, but it just it could have been perhaps clarified in in your original statement. I think. That's apologies all. for that, councillor. I, uh, I I, I agree. You. It could have been. I could <coughs> agree. It could have been better presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Rowan. Um, so, yes, Ms. Davis, we'd like to proceed with the presentation and the slides. Hopefully, um, is, this, will, this will add that, that level of detail um, and, and we will all get that understanding. Thank you. Chair, if I can just ask, uh, would you, should we put the slides up on the, the screen so that uh, all, that, all members can, can see that whilst that Ms. Davis be, goes through it? Thank you. That, that would be great. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyer. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Are we now on the second slide of that presentation? We are indeed. I, I've attended to, um, uh, I think I present, mentioned everything there. So I think we go to slide two. Thank you very much. OK, so this would um, maximise the, the social care income for 21-22 uh, and would indeed result in um, a lower retained income uh, for pension aid service users uh, and, people, uh, uh, and people who currently don't pay for care or have disability related household expenses. Um, so uh, People of uh, social care, uh, social care changes, uh, sorry, social care charges for people of pension age receiving care and support in their own home will face increased charges in line, with the, in line with their pension increases for the two years that we mentioned. And people in long stay care homes will face increases in line with the rise in their pension income. Uh, however, uh, it's not on the screen, but they will retain the minimum income guarantee and the personal expenses alone. So the, the, the money that they retain would uh, would not change in that sense, uh, or the minimum that they would retain would not change in that, in, in, in this process. Uh, and um, the second point is that people who have a review of their financial assessment uh, may may have an increased charge, uh, but the outcome of all that cannot be quantified until we have completed all the reviews. Um, so there is a bit of a challenge for us in doing this. We, we assessment and review capacity due to COVID-19 pressures, um, but uh, we are confident that we can undertake that robust review process. Uh, we have done it uh, before some years back. Uh, and agreed, it is difficult, very difficult to quantify the exact effect on income generation so because of the um, wide variety of factors, such as rent and council tax increases and mortgage payments, that do form part of this um, uh, um, means test uh, uh, based uh, financial assessment. And indeed, as I said earlier, all the savings we're presenting you with are based on the assumption that the Department of Health and Social Care frees the minimum income guarantee and the personal expenses allowance. Uh, and that is based on our 
um, best understanding of what we anticipate they will do. Unfortunately, um, they tend not to tell us uh, that they've done that or what they're going to do with it until uh, the third, sometimes the third or even the last week of March. So if I could go to my, um, slide three, please. Thank you. So the effect would be that people getting their care homes on state pension will see charges increased on average by uh, nine pence 88 a week. If they have an occupational pension uh, as well, then their charges could go up by 11 pence, 28 pence per week on average. Um, I, we have tried to break that down for you into detailed proposals. So the delivery of the 200,000 save, 200, pounds saving identified by applying the 3.9% increase to pension income uh, from 2021 that was put on hold, this will affect um, 686 people. Now, obviously that number changes because the number of people receiving care from the local authority changes uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, um, but um, on, the, on the very recent count of the number of people that it would affect, then it would be 686 people receiving care in their own home in, as, in the community. And that would result in an average increase of charges of five pounds 93 per week. But to give you some other idea of the range, the highest increase would be £11.82 that we've identified, and the lowest would be 95 pence uh, per week. Um, delivering the £312,000 saving by applying the 2.5% increase to state retirement income uh, uh, in April 2021. I do apologise, it said April 20 there, it is, should be 2021. Uh, and indeed, the review of the occupational and private pension income that will affect in total 1,182 people uh, and create an average increase of £3.95 per week. Again, the highest um, uh, in, uh, impact there would be someone who, who uh, has an increase of £7.42 per week and the lowest increase would be 59p. Um, I should say at this point that um, towards the end uh, uh, here, my colleague Sue uh, Bins has uh, created some graphs to give you to, uh, some idea of the range here. And uh, when we get to that point, I will hand, hand over to Sue to be able to uh, uh, explain those. Uh, the reviewing of occupational income um, uh, uh, will affect 959 people uh, with an average increase of £1.40 per week, the highest being as high as £9.12 and the lowest uh, two pence per week. Um, slide four, if I may. Thank you. Um, people in care homes, in long, long stay care, uh, will, will see their charges go up by £3.95 per week on average. Uh, if, they also, if they also have an occupational pension, the charge could go up by £5.35 per week. And on current figures, this will affect 496 people. Um, and it's important to say that um, someone in long stay residential care will continue to retain a personal expenses allowance of £24.90 per week and keep £5.75 per week of any pension credit saving. Uh, so that will be unchanged. Similarly, uh, a single pensioner in the community will retain at least £194.50 per week. Um, now, it should be said at this point that the minimum income guarantee applied in Herefordshire is slightly higher than the minimum income guarantee set by the Department of Health and Social Care. So the Department of Health and Social Care set a MIG rate of £189 per week. And indeed the standard min minimum income guarantee for pension credit is £177.10. But Herefordshire applies a higher rate uh, uh, of that. Uh, this relates back to 2016, uh, the first consultation after the introduction of the CARE Act um, when the consultation was based on an, expert, an anticipation that the minimum income guarantee would be going up in line with inflation, which it had done for the years previously. Um, and what happened rather remarkably was that the central government froze that minimum income guarantee, but having undertaken a consultation, of course, uh, we retained uh, a higher figure and we have done ever since. Uh, for couples, the local minimum in income guarantee rate is £148.47 per week per person, uh, which again is higher than the DHC rate of £144.30 per week uh, uh, per person. Uh, if I could, and again, obviously no change in MIG and PEA values. If I could go to slide five, please. 
Thank you. So things to note um, uh, that uh, increased council tax or rent or mortgage payments will reduce social care charges and we're not able to calculate the impact of those at this stage. Um, and people in receipt of attendance allowance at the higher rate of £89.60 per week uh, who only have social care services for day needs, they will keep £29.60 per week of that income in addition to the minimum income guarantee amount mentioned above uh, due to the income disregard. Uh, that's a very technical statement and if there are questions on that I would ask my colleague Sue Binns to be able to take you through that. Um, all of these calculations, we said, are based on the assumption that the central government set minimum income guarantee and personal expenditure rates remain unchanged. If you could go to uh, um, uh, slide six, uh, and um, with your agreement, uh, Madam Chairman, I would ask Susie Binns uh, to take us through this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, the, this uh, spread of, uh, of, of impact uh, that she has put together for us. Susie, could you take it? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, right. So this slide on the left hand side um, is basically showing how that spread for the 3.9% increase in pension income that we would be applying from uh, this current financial year that was put on hold. So that's showing that uh, within the range of um, increased charge, we've got at the bottom part, um, there would only be 10 people that would be affected by over £10 a week. And at the other end, we've got at the very top um, 19 people affected by between zero and 299. So as you can see, the majority of the uh, increase is around uh, between the five and seven pound level where the majority of our service users would uh, have that uh, figure applied, which is why obviously the average has come out at the uh, five pounds 93. Um, on the right hand side, what we're demonstrating there is the increase of uh, the combined inflationary increase on pension credit, uh, sorry, pension benefits for 2021, plus what their pensions are going to go up by, uh, sorry, the 3.9 is for 2021, and then an additional 2.5% for 21-22 that will be going up this April. This graph is showing the combined effect of those two increases. So again, as you can see, we've got quite small numbers affected by less than four, that's 12 people. And at the bottom end, again, 20 people affected by the highest increase between 16 and 19 pounds. And again, in, in the center, we've got where the, the most of the spread is, which is between the seven pounds and the 13 pounds. So that's the overall increase um, in charges that would apply uh, based on their income from state pensions. But as Mr Davis has already uh, pointed out, there are a lot of other factors included in the financial assessment that will, infect, will affect the overall figure, which unfortunately we're not able to provide you today because we have to wait to find out, for example, how much rents are going up, how much extra housing benefit people are going to get with council tax. If we change the council tax means test, how much extra benefit they might get through council tax. So until all those other factors are worked through, we can't come up with an actual figure of the impact of income on individuals. But all we can give you is an idea based on the pension income, because that is a fixed figure that we know is going to go up by that percentage. OK, I think that's the, is there another slide? Yeah. And then this this slide uh, represents the impact on people in care homes. So uh, they are affected less than the other people that live in their own homes, basically because we did apply an inflationary increase on pensions to people in care homes last year. We were able to do that because uh, the means test was very, very static for people in care homes. They weren't impacted by a lot of the uh, financial support measures that were coming in for working age and council tax as a result of the COVID pandemic. So we did make the decision to inflate uh, the income for those uh, particular residents. So this graph is just showing that um, the impact of the 2.5% increase on state pensions, with again, the majority coming out between uh, three and 4.99. Uh, and again, at the, two, the other two ends, we've got between naught and 2.99, 71 people impacted by that lower cost and 
between six and 750, we've got 22 people at the top end. So that those are the people that would be paying the most as a result of the uh, changes. And again, as Mr. Davis uh, mentioned in, in the previous slides, these individuals would still maintain their £24.90, plus if they get savings credit within pension credit, they'll keep 575 of that as well. I think that's the final slide, thank you. Thank you, Susie. M Madam Chairman, if I just may add, um, there are significant numbers of people in Herefordshire who, uh, once the calculation that Susie and her team take place are, um, uh, are nil, nil payers, there, there is no charge uh, to them. So uh, obviously that, uh, that, that that's, um, needs to be taken into account. And also, of course, significant numbers of people in Herefordshire who access uh, um, their um, care services uh, without any engagement uh, with, the council, with, with the council at all um, uh, through their own uh, private uh, arrangements. Uh, and um, one of the calculations here, uh, one of the thoughts here in terms of the officers involved in putting this together is that we are also seeking a, uh, a solution that preserves both the quality and the volume of the care services delivered to the people of Herefordshire. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Davis, and thank you very much, uh, Susie Binns. Uh, that was uh, very helpful and a good explanation of actually something that's quite, it's quite difficult, a lot of moving parts to this. And it's, uh, uh, it is it is pretty complicated, although it at first glance appears to be uh, relatively straightforward. If I understand it correctly, though, the um, the three point nine uh, percent has is it, 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 as it were a delayed implementation, um, and and so what what we are doing here is actually aligning to changes that have already happened, um, and and that therefore this this isn't. Um, you know anything that wasn't expected it's simply uh, you know bringing things into alignment in the way in which they uh, inevitably would have would have been um the um the uncertainty around the minimum income guarantee and personal expenses allowance of that do, do we have a, a sense of the risk of whether or not um the uh the the current sort of position of the DHC, um in in leaving the uh, MIG and uh, PEA frozen, and I have to say I, I cannot tell you how tempted I am to make a pun about <laughs> that. Um, whether um, uh, you know a, a sense of what might be the case in March, and and, and for how many years has it remained uh, in stasis? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Susie is closer to this. She she looks at this with, with her colleagues in, in other local authorities in terms of the National Association of Financial Assessment Officers. Uh, I believe it's been um, so. I'll, I'll actually hand over to Susie. We'll know how many years it has actually been frozen. But this is our this is very much our, um, our, our best understanding. But of course, hostage to fortune. Um, back in 2016, we got um, uh, side footed by it. So um, uh, it could happen again. But um, uh, this is a Oh, something happened there. It's this is a, um, a considered opinion, I think, across the UK in terms of the National Association. Susie, would you like to step in? Yes, I can confirm it's five years. So 2016 onwards, it's been frozen. Yeah. Oops, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to welcome Councillor Hitchner into the meeting. Uh, I, I see he's coming. Welcome, uh, Leader of the Council. Can we just confirm that? Uh, that we can hear and see you. Yes, I can uh, see you and hear you. Thank you. Uh, Marvellous. Welcome. Thank you for attending. If I may, I chair, well, just just your word. Yes, Sorry, um, just just aware that, that Councillor Anson uh, uh, has had to leave for uh, for uh, yeah. uh, an urgent uh, appointment. So uh, uh, so we have uh, six voting members currently uh, present in the, in the in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Um, so what else? Uh, oh, uh, the um. The reviews of nil charge payers um, is is this something that is kind of in the normal run of uh, of activity um, uh, the, rather than requiring um, special uh, resource to to undertake? We it won't we won't be using special resource. It it is part of a um, it, it is not unusual activity. Um, what we're saying is that within here we will be able to. Uh, uh, create, uh, shall we say, even greater emphasis than we normally do. 
Uh, I mean, Susie may be able to, again, respond to uh, how that's being structured within her team. Uh, it is, as I said, something that we did uh, some years back in terms of the focus of the work over a particular year, a few years back. Um, but uh, it's a, it's, but it is um, normal business, but with a particular emphasis on on nil charge because re reviewing uh, assessments is, is quite standard. Uh, but with a particular emphasis on nil charge players and disability related expenditure, uh, um, because uh, this is where circumstances change. People's circumstances change, um, and um, if we ask them, they tell us. Um, but they may not always automatically be able to tell us straight away that the circumstances have changed. Thanks. Susie, yeah. would you want to, is there any further? Yeah. Um, do, do you want me to expand on that a little? Yes. Um, yes, you, just before you do, I'm just going to say if any, any other members of the committee, if you want to start framing some questions or any recommendations and uh, if you want to come in, that's, that would be lovely. I see Councillor Bartlett. So, uh, if Ms Binns, if you could just carry on with uh, just, just a bit more detail there and then I will start, I will go open up to the committee. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Uh, yes, just to clarify, normally what we would do um, every April when we uplift the, or when the benefits get lifted and we reassess everybody, everybody gets a letter where they're informed about their financial statement. Uh, they're given the statement and asked to contact us if there's anything wrong on that statement, if there's a change of circumstances to report. So we rely on individuals to report to us. So inevitably, sometimes people won't report to us. So then we will conduct more proactive reviews in terms of identifying where we think there's a likelihood that that person's circumstances may have changed. So this is where this additional work is coming in. But yes, it is something we would normally do, but the way we're going to do it is slightly different, I suppose is the best way to put it. Okay. Thank you, thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Councillor Bartlett. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you uh, to Lee and Spins for the um, uh, presentation. I think I'm getting my head around it. And uh, the Chair will attest that uh, even with an abacus numbers, do seem to slip through my fingers <laughs> sometimes. So what it, I can see, you know, adult social care, it's, it's not, not like going to the NHS as such. It's, you know, it's not free at the point of entry. So it is, um, it is either self-funded or means tested. Um, and, you know, most, most people, as we know, tend to be self-funding. So looking at the slides in numbers that are presented, seems to be the case here as well, that we're not actually talking about everybody who's receiving social care. It's just those that are receiving some kind of um, help from, from us. Absolutely, cor absolutely correct, Councillor. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a, quite a small percentage of the adults in the county, but it's, it's, it's going to affect everybody who's on a pension who's receiving care from us so um one of the things that strikes me with it I mean say that it's it's quite a movable thing of how many people at one time are receiving this and sometimes they're receiving more financial assistance sometimes less financial assistance and their uh, situation can change so and in terms of the appeals that they can report apply to an additional signposting. Can we make sure that if we are charging people, we are also helping them to assess any help that they can get above the um, MIG and the PEA, and that they are signposted adequately if we're going to go ahead with the, um, as obviously we are going to need to go ahead with these, these changes to, um, to the charging. Uh, by by taking those uplifts, the one that we didn't do last year and the one that we're going to have to do for this year, 3.9 and the 2.5. 2 um, and except that they're still going to receive their minimum payments, which is good. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's unfortunate, isn't it? So we've got a situation, it feels like we're, we are. We do seem to be charging some people quite a lot, but it does very much appear that in order to do, we need to do that in order to make sure that the people who can't afford afford this do actually get as much help as we can give them. Um, 
So the, the other thing that, that I felt was a little bit, un, I couldn't quite get my head around was on the, on the um, slide that had the two scales, you've got a different Y axis. So it was a little bit, I wasn't quite sure whether you had two, two different Y axis, how they, they kind of butted together. So that was, that was a little confusing for me. Um, and the other, the other thing that, 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 that worries, well, it doesn't worry me. It, it, I'm a little unsure of, we now are saving more money than we set out to save with our original budget um, proposals. So in the overall budgeting, where does, I was wondering if Mr. Lovegrove could maybe say what happens to the fact that we now have a different overall budget saving than we had the first time round. Um, I think if I, if I just briefly come in there, uh, Council Bartlett, I think that this, what's come about is that we'd had this identified 330, which then was in reality 320 that we had to uh, reallocate, but the 200 savings that's in this was in the original. Um, so the total was always uh, 520, if that, if that helps. Uh, is that is that uh, about right? Thank uh, you, Chairman. I'd agree. Yes, I'm the saving target for the civils has been five twenty. The two hundred, as you saw last time, and what you're seeing now is is the the, the difference. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and and I think if we could fashion a recommendation around signposting and support, that that I think would be very appropriate. Uh, Councillor Tillett. Thank you, Chair. I I I guess you may have noticed my vigorous head shaking at one point during uh, the vice chair's comments just now. And I want to pick that point up with a slight, slightly more vigor than perhaps uh, she felt uh, Abacus ha uh, hobbled to do so. Um, and it's, it's a beef of mine that this committee has heard before. Um, so I am not aiming it specifically against officers but statistics and in particular graphic representations of statistics are there to clarify the situation. And if you choose to change axes on two com compar compar comparative graphs, they become almost invalid. And as Councillor Bartlett quite rightly pointed out that penultimate slide with the two um, graphs side by side the, the axes are totally different and give a, a really rather a, a rather more benign picture. Now I'm not suggesting it has been done deliberately, um, but unless you use the same axes, comparison becomes almost pointless. Um, while those two graphs were up, I was quickly doing the sums. Now, those who are going to pay less than four pounds extra go from 97 down to 12. The, the magnitude of that difference is not illustrated because the way the axes change. And even more dramatically, the people who are going to pay more than 10 pounds extra goes from 10 up to 335 people. So the difference is marked. I absolutely understand why, but please, please, when you're using stats and graphs, and I know I'm an ex-science teacher, so you must expect this flack from me. Please, can we present them in a consistent way that makes comparison valid and helpful and illustrative to anyone looking at them, rather than having to dig through the figures and work it out for ourselves. End of lecture. There is no need to see me after class, but please, let's not do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tillett. I think that was a, a, a forcefully made point. Uh, Mr Davis? Uh, yeah, it's a fucking hard. First of all, uh, acknowledge the point about the, the, the way the slides were presented, and that's certainly something we'll, we'll, we'll take forward in terms of future presentation. Um, uh, but uh, if I can um, just uh, provide some reassurance to Councillor Bartlett, um, and again, I, I think I might, uh, Susie might be able to give some detail, but when we uh, when we notify people of their charging, we also notify them of uh, the appeals process. Um, uh, so there is an appeals process that we notify them of. Uh, there is also um, a, a, a separate part, a distinct part 
of uh, Susie's team uh, that um, provides um, uh, advice on uh, accessing benefits and indeed um, supports people uh, in tribunals to access all the benefits that they're entitled to. Um, so there is also an internal support team uh, to enable vulnerable people uh, to ensure that they are maximizing their income. Um, so that, that may be, um, it may provide some reassurance to, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I, uh, I, yes, I'm not at all surprised that we have um, uh, good uh, support in place um, and, and the signposting indeed also good. Uh, Councillor Bartlett, is there any additional signposting that you feel would be appropriate um, having heard what Mr. Davis has said? Not off the top of my head. It's, it's good to hear that it's, um, it's proactive signposting. And I think that for me is the key word is it's proactive signposting that that whenever there is a change. Um, and again, with the people who, who were nil, um, the, the, the final eight, 8K, uh, that they are actually proactively um, signposted. So it would appear that uh, our recommendation has been, has been, uh, fears have been allayed already. Thank you. So you're content to remove that as a recommendation? Thank, thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Summers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, something on uh, Mr. Davis's comment on appeals. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite normal to have for anyone to make an appeal on something. My question is, and uh, more often than not, it's, it's quite difficult and you have to go th jump through a, a whole bunch of hoops to get where you want to go. So the question is, how easy is the appeal process? I've, my concern is if an elderly person has gone through an appeal process, we have a mental health issue again. And uh, I think we should have, if we don't have anybody in place to help them through this, then we, then we possibly should. So it is a concern. It's quite normal to throw that in, everything as an appeal process, but how easy is it when, when, you, when they come to do it? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, well, I, I would certainly would. I've not done it myself, so um, I, I, I possibly can't answer the question as well as, as I might like if I if I went through if I walked through the system as a customer. Uh, I certainly hope it's uh, relatively straightforward, uh, and um, people can be assisted to 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 do that. They can be supported to do that. So although the appeal must come from the person themselves, some, someone uh, working with them, and indeed people with uh, lasting power of attorney and so on can support people. I believe, Susie. Uh, Susie, you, you take the first appeal uh, and then it comes through to me. So I, I don't know whether you want to comment on uh, just how easy it is, but I believe it's just a, a letter back. I mean, the ones I see are just people coming back and saying, I think I'm paying too much. I don't agree with this assessment. Yes, there is slightly more to it. We, we do accept the letter, but we do also have a form where we gather all the information about their income and outgoings any other additional information they want to share with us that will help support the appeal. So we will assist them through actually submitting the appeal. Then obviously if they want support from an independent advocate, they can have that as well, but we will help them with the initial appeal form um, if, if that is required. And as Lee has already mentioned, Mr. Davis has already mentioned, um, if they have power of attorney or family members to support them, um, you know, they, they can obviously do that as well. Um, if they are unsuccessful at the first stage of the appeal, then yes, that would then go through our complaint system um, to be looked at uh, by the head of service. So that there are two stages to the appeals process. Is it possible that we, be, that we can be given the process and see documentation, et cetera, that, that has to be filled out? Um, I don't have to worry too much about it, but I just went through it with a 97 year old mother that, you know, she had to go to the kids to get help with a lot of this stuff. And I'm very concerned about that aspect of things. You go into a care home and we have elderly people that really don't know a lot of what they're doing anymore. And we really need to be helping them. So if, if there's anyone on staff that can actually, uh, well, we can't do it with COVID, but in the future that we can actually go to these these, these people and sit down with them and go through the paperwork and the process of, of an appeal it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yes, that is what we would normally do. We would normally sit down with them and go through it with them. 
And as I say, we have a form, but we don't have to use the form. It can be as just as simple as writing a letter if that's preferred. So we try and make it as easy as possible for them to go through that process. Thank you. Um, any, any more questions from members of the committee to officers? Okay, in that case, uh, I can turn to the cabinet members who are present and uh, ask um, them. Chair, I think um, Mr. Smith was trying to get your attention. Oh, was he? I, I don't have his hand. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just in response to Councillor Summers' point, I wanted to add to the response that Susie gave. Um, you'll be aware, Councillor Summers, we do also commission an, an independent advocacy service, which is, which is just about to be uh, recommissioned. Um, and as on an average basis, we generally have around 450 people who are with a live advocate at any one time. So that's generally the sort of... So there is a very robust and rigorous uh, uh, support network for appeals as well. So you should have that assurance as councillors. That's interesting. Thank you. Uh, Mr Davis? Hey, sorry, yes. Just to, just to, just to confirm... Um, uh, as, as Susie said, we do support people through the process. We do support people the use of the form if, if we need to use the form, but we don't always. But the process can be triggered just by someone saying, you know, I think this is too much. I don't, I don't think this is right. Can you come and check it? Uh, can we look at it again? So it, 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 the initial appeal process is not a, a difficult formal process to fill in. The initial appeal process is, um, I, I, I don't like this. Something, something's wrong here. Yeah or something I don't agree with. And, you know, as, as, as simple as that, uh, uh, we can start from there and support people with a more detailed understanding or a more detailed analysis. Thank you, that's very reassuring. Uh, members of the committee have any other questions for officers? Well, Councillor Summers, oh, you have a th thumbs up. You're satisfied with that. Good, I'm glad. Um, okay, so now I can turn to the cabinet members now, uh, if they have any comment that they would like to make on the amended budget saving proposals, so I'll start with the leader of the council, Councillor Hitchener. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, I haven't been involved on in, in all this meeting, so I think probably uh, it's better if I just uh, defer to my colleagues. Thank you. That's perfect. Sorry perfect. about that. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Councillor Liz Harvey, Cabinet Member of Finance and Corporate Services. Councillor Harvey, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to thank the committee for um, getting together for this extra meeting to begin with. Um, it was uh, it was none of our plans to uh, have to come back with an amendment to the uh, to the budget for the uh, the adults directorate. But um, uh, it was important that we took account of this uh, new case law. So thanks to committee and thanks to officers for uh, the hard work that they've done in looking at what the options are in order for us to be able to uh, deliver on the savings target. Um, thank you for the, uh, the questions and the queries that you've raised. Um, it, all these savings are really difficult. Um, so uh, this uh, bring ourselves in alignment with, uh, with government policy on this one. Um, was uh, one of the, the the less painful options that we had, but as you can see from the uh, the figures that are uh, presented in the report, they uh, these changes will have a material effect on on people's um, uh, charges for care in their in their home, and um, obviously we're uh, you know we're very, very mindful of that, and um, and officers do take a huge amount of care in. Uh, in making sure that we get the assessments right. So um, I'd like to assure the committee that, you know, a lot of thought has gone into this. And um, as, the, uh, um, as the savings programmes rolled out, we will be continuing to monitor the, uh, the effects and, um, and make sure that, uh, you know, we're not getting any un unintended consequences. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvin. Thank you for the for the additional reassurance on the uh, potential impact of of, of these uh, decisions. Uh, Councillor Ange Tyler, Cabinet Member, Housing Regulatory Services, Community Safety. Councillor Tyler. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, it's um it's just it's very difficult to see increases in um, particularly services as as adult, adult uh, social care, but um, it's something we have to look into and deliver these services as we can. So just to say thank you to the committee and uh, our officers for 
looking at these these issues and uh, delivering what we can do through our budget setting. So thank you all and um, thank you for letting me sort of be part of the meeting today. Thank you and thank you very much for, for, for attending. Uh, thank you also to Councillor Harvey and Councillor Hitchin for their attendance today. Uh, do committee members have any questions for the cabinet members? No. So the committee has been asked to determine any recommendation it wishes to make to cabinet in relation to the 2021-22 proposed amended budget saving proposals. Can I invite committee members to identify whether they wish to propose any recommendations? Do we want to make a formal recommendation about the presentation of those the two graphs, or we can, is that that will simply be amended? We have, if it helps, uh, Madam Chairman, we're very we're very um, uh, happy to amend. Uh, Thank you. I don't, I don't feel that it needs a formal recommendation. It seems a little disproportionate. Uh, do we have any any further recommendations? No. No, I think we can probably just... So we just have the recommendations as, as, is, as on the agenda. Yeah. So can I have a proposal and a seconder for the recommendations as on the agenda? Mr. Boyle, are you, are you content with this at the moment? Um, well, if, if there's no formal recommendations um, coming forward, obviously members have oh. had um, reassurances about various things which should be captured yeah. in the minutes and we can return to those points through the through the year as necessary, perhaps. Um, so, so I guess it's it's to note the uh, the, um, the the change in the, the amended saving proposal um, uh, without any further comment. Yes, I think that's that's where we're at. I think we've we, we've sought reassurance. We've been given reassurance. And I don't think that there, there are any um, recommendations to be to be made. Um, so we can propose that we accept the uh, the saving as proposed. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna have a second of that. Councillor Summers is seconding that for you, Chair. Oh, thank you, Councillor Summers. Thank you. So uh, I will ask committee members to vote on the recommendations by an electronic vote. Please can non-voting attendees be moved to the breakout room and the number of voting members be confirmed. Yes, Chair, there's six voting members. Uh, I'm just waiting for the other members to leave the room. Won't be okay. a second. The Hitchener has um, joined our, our scrutiny committee. <laughs> can I can I promise just promise not to vote? Or do you... Get, no, let me out. <laughs> Take him away. Or shall I just leave the meeting? I can... Oh, there we go. We've got a... Yes, you just don't vote. Out, so it's probably the thing. Leave the meeting. There we go. There we go. Uh, so you should have the voting screen now. If you could vote for, against, or abstain, and press the submit button. Okay, Chair. All the results are in, and those have been unanimously accepted. Thank you very much. Uh, please, can non-voting attendees be brought back into the meeting? Assuming that they want to come back in. <laughs> Okay, so agenda item seven, which is the date of the next meeting. Now, please note the date of the next scheduled meeting is the 29th of March, 2021, and I'm formally closing this meeting.